All right, so we're going to go ahead and set up our remaining server here with clustered ZFS that will allow us to have replication across the devices very fast. So I'm going to walk you through the steps I've already taken. If we look through the other servers, I've already set up a pool called storage. This is a RAID 0 array. So I'm setting up a RAID 0 array that has to be done from the command line. There's only one way to do it, and it's from the command line. So if you are going to endeavor to do this and you're going to use ZFS RAID 0, be aware you need to have backups located on a different device because if a RAID 0 blows out, all of your data on both of the disks is gone along with all of those machines. Now, if you have failover and if you have differencing that is pretty up to date, that might not be too terrible of a loss, but that is not a safety mechanism in any stretch of the imagination. And we will be setting up backups with all of everything that we're doing on Proxmox. It's about the only way to go. Be sure to check out the Digital Space Cast, the weekly podcast that brings you guests and dives deeper into the Chiaverse, available on every platform that you get your podcast from. You can visit us at digitalspaceport.com forward slash spacecast. Disk set for ZFS on Prox0. On Prox1, I have not. On Prox2, I've created it. On Prox3, I've created it. On Prox4, I have not. And on Prox5, I have. So let me show you on Prox2 and on Prox4 what the steps are to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go down here, drop to the shell. And here we're going to paste in the following. And now if you look, you're going to see that I've got Z pool create. We're going to be doing an A shift of 12. We're going to create the exact same name for all of these storage locations. I'm just naming it storage. This is where the VM disks are going to live. It'll be really fast, really performant, and also distributed. And migrating will be super easy if I need to take a machine down and do some service on it. No downtime. So we need to have two other variables that we plug in here. This command is in the links below. So if in case you need it, you can find it there. So go to your disks real quick and you'll see that we I have my Samsung SSDs. These are 870 EVOs located here. And we can see that we've got our dev SDC and our dev SDD. Now, if you see your SSDs or your high performance storage that you're going to be using for this, and it has you know a bunch of stuff on it, or maybe it's a ButterFS or an NTFS if you've moved it over from some other system, go ahead and use the wipe disk command. So I'm going to go ahead and type dev SDC and dev SDD. And so we now have created the pool. If we go over here to ZFS, we'll see that we've got yet another one. If we double click it, we can see the details. And that's what we're expecting to see. Now, we've got one last one to do. You'll notice that you don't see the storage showing up over here on any of these. Since you're creating a RAID 0 from the command line, it essentially gives you a different set of options. Let me show you what it gives you an option. It, it does not add the storage. You don't need to add the storage. You can actually, we're going to go through the steps to add the storage later. We'll replicate throughout the all, remainder of them as long as they have the same name. That's kind of the beauty of the Proxmox clustering file system. It will keep that in all of the servers. And that is a endpoint that will be common amongst them all as long as you've named it exactly the same. So let's say you were going to go ahead and select a couple of devices here. You would want to only have your last device that you're doing this on have the add storage button checked and then it will bring it over. You can actually leave it unchecked on all of them and we'll walk you through the steps to set it up in just a second. Nope, prox one. And fire up the shell here. And we need to get the disks. So I can see here that we've got SDB and SDC on this machine. So that's Okay, it literally is that simple. And you can see we now have this storage pool online. So the next thing that we need to do is we're going to go ahead and cluster all of these together. So I had removed them from the clusters so that I would be able to illustrate this. A lot of people had asked me about ZFS in particular and cluster filing systems. Sound up below. Let me know what you're thinking, if this is something that is helpful and beneficial to you. And so I'm going to go to data center here. I'm going to go to cluster. I'm going to cl click on create cluster. And the cluster name is just going to be 
digital cluster. Whenever it says task OK, you've completed the task. You can always follow along by going to the status window and it'll say stopped if you are a little bit concerned about that. So I'm going to click on the join information, click the copy information here, close this out. Like we're going to go through this real fast. So, okay. So when we come back over here, we can see that our cluster has started to show up and it looks like cluster prox5 has shown up as the final one in this cluster. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go to here and click on storage. We're going to add a storage option. This storage option is going to be ZFS. So the name of this is, of course, what we common named everything else, which is storage. And this is going to be attached to this ZFS pool. Now I'm going to enable thin provisioning. So this will allow it to grow and shrink as it needs so it can reclaim space and only use the space that it needs. When you're using thin provisioning, do keep in mind you need to be a little bit more mindful of the size of your uh, disks as you get to like 75%. It's a good recommendation to go ahead and add capacity that is growing the size of your disk array so that you do not end up running out of space. That's a little bit of a pain in the butt to come back on. Make sure that nodes is set to all so that there's no restrictions on it. The enable box should be checked and you can just leave it at 8K. All right, so that is it. Now that I've added that in, we will see the storage show up over here underneath each individual one of these. So if we go here, 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 and here, we can see that we've got our common storage amongst all of them now. All right, so if you have done this, I hope that you have some good networking. I've discovered that even bonded pairs of gigabit is pretty good, uh, but what you really want is 10G minimums. Links to some cards below that are pretty darn affordable. For most servers and desktops, they'll work in usually either environment that can get you to that 10G speed. Cool video on that coming up soon. I've got some really cool hardware on the way though, so there's gonna be a lot of hardware-based videos coming up in the next couple of weeks. So we've got one more step to take here to set up our HA. So we're gonna go to the data center view, we're gonna go to groups, we're gonna click on create, and now we're going to give our self a name and we're going to select the nodes that we want to include in this cluster. So if you have some, uh, let's say maybe uh, specialized nodes, maybe GPU based nodes or something like that, maybe a lot of host pass through nodes that are not going to be easy to migrate around from machine to machine. Now you can set it on an individual VM level as well, but you might want to create a kind of different clustering for those also. Maybe you've got a bunch of storage and you have a bunch of compute and you want to segregate those layers. And so you want your compute nodes over here and your like storage nodes over here. That's another thing that you can do when you're setting up your HA groups. And then you can create fencing and make sure things, you know, prioritize and kind of stay within that. For this, I'm just gonna actually go ahead and set up a big one. We'll come back. This is something you can remove after you set it up and kind of customize. So we're just gonna call this digital HA, not restricted. We're gonna have leave fail back on. We've got all the nodes checked. Uh, there's one of these that I definitely wouldn't, the one with four CPUs, I definitely would not have that be one of the kind of failovers there. Um, but we're just gonna leave it like it is for now. So we're gonna click that. So now we've got our group. If you wanna remove it, you can click it and just click remove. Go to HA here. And so if you go to add resources, it'll kind of pop up and it'll ask you which VM do you want to have be a part of this group. So you need to already have VMs. We don't have any VMs imported right yet, but I've got a bunch of them. I'm gonna be importing them here in a few seconds. After that's done, then we'll set this up. But over here, you can see that we've got the group, digital HA. So things will live inside that cluster of the potential. And this becomes especially important if you're running like host pass through things. Again, those aren't really gonna play super well when you're trying to migrate them. Uh, even if you've got the exact same stuff on the next machine, it probably has a different identifier. And so that's going to cause some problems. So that VM, you might not want to bring over in a started state. Instead, you might want to bring it over in a stopped state. That would probably be a little bit better. Okay. So after you get your wind share mounted, if you've got username and password, you probably need to go ahead and just do it from the command line. There's some information that I'll link below where you can find out how to do that just as one of those things that's a little bit problematic sometimes uh, without doing it from the command line. So I'm going to select all my backup images, drag them up into the dump folder. And so now that they're in the dump folder, 
if we go over here, we can see that on our Prox1 cluster, we've now added the WinShare, and the WinShare has backups, and the backups have all of our VMs. Very nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and restore the first VM here after I show the configuration. Make sure that I don't have anything weird passed through or anything that's gonna break anything. This one looks like it's pretty good. This is just a basic CentOS utilities disk. Uh, I'm gonna also check out the configuration for the second one. This one should have, yeah, Sandy Bridge, Flags, PCID, and AES. And it's a MySQL server. And if I look down here a little bit further, I've got Service Desk, Jira, Confluence, and then a couple of extra VMs here, it looks like. So you can see the size of these. The VMA Z stand uh, is basically a very compressed, only the data that is actually inside there gets compressed down into that. So I'm gonna go ahead and install, restore these first couple. So I'm gonna restore this one. Uh, if you leave from backup configuration, it's going to count on the storage being named the same as it was in the configuration. I'm gonna go ahead and click restore and we're going to replace this storage. We're gonna of course put it on the storage uh, drive. You can set bandwidth limit and stuff like that also. You can check unique if you would like to generate an automatic MAC address, but I've already done that for all of these some time ago. So these are not like templates or anything like that. So they should be pretty cool to go. So I'm gonna click restore and restore this. Okay, so we are done there. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that out now. Now, if I go to storage here and we look at VM disks, we're gonna see that we've got our first VM disk. It just doesn't even show because it's so small. Now let's go take a look at storage over here. So you notice that it is not in all of the other storages. Okay, so we've got our machine running here. It's on Prox1. This is our CentOS utilities disk again. I'm also pinging this over here so that you can see the cutover times and what the implications look like when you start doing migrations and have high availability and what that kind of real world looks like for somebody. So let's go through the setup here really quick of a couple of things to make sure that we're, we're good. We've got our high availability clusters here. If you notice, I've given a couple of priorities. I've given two and one as a priority. So two would be a greater priority than one. And so if I reverse those to two, to two down here and one up here, it would move the VM. We don't want to do that yet. There's a reason why, because it would basically require a full move at this point. We haven't set up replication. So first off, we want to set up replication. Go to your VM that you want to do this on, click on the VM, click on replication. We're gonna set up the replication groups that we want this. So this is one of the places where it's good to define your groupings in HA, and it's also good to have those conform to the groupings that you set up on a VM by VM level. That I think is a pretty important concept. Now, if you want to dive deeper on this, of course, you probably better join up the Discord because that's where I can answer these kind of questions in depth, links to that below. All right, so I'm gonna put this over on, uh, let's say to Prox4. And we'll just have this set at every 15 minutes. That's good. Unlimited, whatever. Hit create and we should be good. Now, if you see the status, it says it's okay. And we're gonna go ahead and click schedule now. It is running the initial sync. That's a full sync. So that's a lot of data, even though it's just a six gig file, it is moving that entire file over the first time. After it's done this first time, it's gonna do what's called a differential move. So that's looking at the Delta, which is essentially the change between the bits that have happened in that period of time since the last sync. So it does not need to resync everything. So that means if there is a failover instance, however many interval minutes it is in between there and what changes happen between those two is essentially where you were restored to. So this is a concept in HA that you need to be kind of aware of. There's two different underlying mechanisms here at play. So we have ZFS sync. That is different than what we might be thinking of as a shared storage component. Shared storage being able to replicate across all the machines in real time. Again, needing pretty expensive dedicated networking for that. So once the status says OK here, you can click the log if you want to check it out and you can see that the replication job has indeed completed. So we now have the image living over here on the disk. However, the VM itself has not been spun up. So we don't have a resource added to the H of high availability grouping yet. So we're going to go ahead, add the CentOS utilities here. We're going to select the group that we've got here and then we're going to click on add. So that will start that up. It'll queue it 
And once it's done processing, it's going to basically create a association set between the two hosts. Now, the hosts will be able to automatically pick the priority channel of which one should be running the machine based upon the weights that we gave them in the group. So again, if we look here and we check out the HA group, we can see that on these two, uh, we've got a two and a one and an unset. So I'm going to go ahead and give Prox4 a higher priority. I'm going to bump this one up to three and we'll click OK. And watch what happens as soon as that kicks off and gets picked up by the HA manager. Again, keep your eye on the ping that's happening over here to the machine. So you can see now that it's running a migrate. Once that migrate's done, and it should be done pretty quickly, then we'll see that we're actually able to have that machine spin up on the other node. Okay, and that's done, literally that fast. We had one ping missed there. So that is the cool part about high availability. That is a darn fast system. And it's now up and running over here on this machine. Really cool. And you can switch things back and forth really easily. Now, some people might be wondering, what the hell is happening to my RAM if you're running ZFS? I'm gonna link you to this because it's funny and I like that picture of the penguin eating the RAM stick. That's awesome. Your RAM is fine. ZFS is generally gonna be a little bit of an om nom nobbler of your RAM. Now you can check your RAM using some of the commands here and it does give you a really good indicator of the ones you need to watch out for Java. Java likes to eat your RAM. So you're gonna be looking for something that is your out of memory, which I call om nom nom nom. Uh, those are the things that if you're running on a base system are going to present problems. You're not going to find that happening inside Proxmox, inside a, the Proxmox clustering and file management system. It's very aware of that. So as a VM needs more RAM, it'll compete and regain that RAM. So it's just basically how the Linux kernel versus the ZFS edition handles RAM management. And the Linux kernel kind of shows things as free, even though they're cached and the ZFS shows them as utilized, even though they're reclaimable. So those are two differences that the concept that you might be concerned with, but don't worry if you're using ZFS in Proxmox. Now, if you're using ZFS on a bare metal machine and you're running Java and some other stuff on it, then yeah, maybe you should actually be a little bit more concerned because those things will eat up that RAM and boy, they get complainy whenever it tries to grab it back. Everybody, make sure you hit me up at GoSpaceport on Twitter. The website, digitalspaceport.com. Links to a bunch of stuff below. Everybody, have a great rest of your day. Be sure to hit like and subscribe and check out these videos for more information on your favorite crypto topics.